All right, hello everyone and welcome. Very big welcome to uh, all our registrations for this CCNA Security MOOC run through IT Masters. So registrations are very strong and we've got people from everywhere in, so excellent to see a good turnout tonight. Uh, so welcome. Uh, this uh, short course is in partial preparation for the official CCNA security exam and we'll look at that in detail in, in, in a minute. Uh, just to introduce myself, my name's Matt Constable. Uh, I hope some of you may have seen uh, the video up on YouTube so you'll know what I look like. Uh, I've been in the IT industry for about 20 years. The last 16 of that have been primarily networking, security, uh, a little bit of wireless and some voice over IP. So um, worked across a number of different sectors, government education, uh, in some financial services and both on the enterprise and integration side of the fence as well and just recently in some service provider. Uh, so I've got uh, some tertiary qualifications and, and over a period of time I've held many different industry uh, certifications including the um, CCNA security. So hopefully that knowledge and experience, uh, with that knowledge and experience I'll be able to uh, give you some good knowledge and, and put you on the road to your own certification. Uh, but of course I don't have all the answers. Uh, there's a lot of you that have registered and a lot of you out there listening at the moment and uh, we all have something that we can contribute and bring to the table. So uh, one of the things I always like to say is is make sure that you fully engage in this course. It's a free course. Get the most out of it that you can. So engage through the forums in particular with me uh, and uh, the other students because you will find that you will learn so much more off each other than you will if you just go through these course notes and, and through the actual uh, resources that I place up on the web. Okay, just briefly I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Jason Howarth to you. He's the course director in the School of Computing and Mathematics at Charles Sturt University in Bathurst and he's going to talk uh, just through some of the uh, statistics and some of the information about the Master of Information Security uh, course. So if I can change over to you, Jason, uh, off you go. Thanks very much. Good on you. Thank you. Thank you, Matt, and welcome along, everyone. As Matt said, my name is Jason Howarth. I'm a course director at Charles Sturt University. If you look at the top left-hand corner of the slides there, you'll see the, the emblem from Charles Sturt. And Charles Sturt, or CSU as we are known, has linked up with IT Masters now for over 10 years to deliver uh, some really relevant industry-focused IT courses. They're all postgraduate courses, so they're master's level. Um, and the sort of experience that you're going to have through this short course is very similar to the sort of experience you would get as a CSU student within some of these industry subjects that we offer in the master's program. So we do have a number of master's programs. The one up there on screen is the Master of Information Systems Security. And just going through it really quickly, um, it consists of eight what are called core subjects, which all students need to do. So a good mixture there of forensics, information security, uh, cyber law, network security fundamentals, which is based on the Security Plus certification by CompTIA, uh, subject there on professional communications. Uh, but you'll also see on the right-hand side there some industry subjects, industry electives. And they're very much focused on preparation for particular industry certifications. So for example, um, ITE 512, uh, prepare students for the Certified Incident Handler industry exam. Uh, ITE 514 prepares students for the CISSP. So it is a really good mix of uh, academic and industry focused subjects that are, that are based around industry certifications. Um, look, just quickly, it, it's a part-time program. It is meant to be delivered part-time by distance. Uh, it takes about two years to complete by part-time. Um, it is available to students in Australia and also outside Australia. And what's perhaps one of the most interesting features, if you have a background in the industry, um, even if you don't have a bachelor degree, there could be a pathway into the program for you. So you've been working in the IT industry for a while, um, let us know. Uh, you could be eligible for the Masters based on your industry experience. So if you want to find out any more about the course or indeed to find out if you're eligible, you can go to uh, www.itmasters.edu.au and you can also contact me if you've got any questions about the course, um, about your eligibility, about the course content or other courses that we have. So my email's down the bottom there, jhowth at csu.edu.au. So just moving over to the page, um, in terms of 
Charles Sturt University as a, a deliverer of distance education. Uh, you can see there within the Australian market when we line up all of the universities, not all of them shown there of course, in terms of the number of distance education enrolments, you can see that Charles Sturt is miles ahead. We have around about 30,000 distance education students. We have around 10,000 on-campus students. So distance education is our main focus and we deliver it very, very well with uh, common experiences being online lectures such as this one, such as the short course that you're experiencing, is a feature across many of our subjects. So just moving to CSU and where we slot into the overall numbers of postgraduate students. So postgraduate means masters or, or above, essentially, graduate certificate masters. So in terms of other universities within the sector, uh, when you look at IT, postgraduate courses, Again, Charles Sturt University is a long way ahead in terms of number of enrolments. So that's just a snapshot from one year. So it's a two year course as I mentioned, um, 12 subjects, credit is available for people who hold industry certifications in the right area. So that's one way to cut down the number of subjects that you need to do if you do hold credit, if you do hold some of those industry certifications we can look at that for credit. So. Um, I will have a webinar at some point and we will advertise that on the forum so uh, we, can, we can go through in more depth some of the subjects within the, uh, the Master of Information System Security. That's all for tonight, don't want to detract too much from Matt's presentation so I uh, hope you enjoyed the short course everyone and Matt, back to you. Thanks Jason, fantastic. Okay guys, now to the CCNA security content. Okay, so just a bit of admin stuff first. So for those of you who aren't quite sure, class time, you should all have your webinar invites by now, so this will be a nice quick to run through this. Uh, Monday evenings, 7 p.m. Uh, Australian Eastern Standard Time, so that's plus 10 on GMT. Uh, you'll have to obviously adjust your clocks and adjust your settings for wherever you are in your location. Um, the webinars will be, enable, uh, will be available online, so recordings will be uploaded within 24 hours. Uh, there will also be a copy, a PDF copy of the slides placed up on to Moodle, which will be there, that will be there before the lecture, so you can have them before the, the night, so you'll have them in there in front of you to make your notes on. Uh, there will also be numerous other resources that I may put up as time goes on uh, that are relevant to the actual content of the course, and they could include web links, um, PDF documents, uh, some example config files, uh, all sorts of stuff. So keep an eye out for that. Make sure that you check Moodle fairly regularly. So I would say you know log in a couple of two, two or three times a week at least to check out what material updates there may may be there, and and of course use the forums as I said earlier. Uh, use the forums as much as you can to make sure that you get the best out of a, a free course. Okay, so my contact details: matt.constable at itmasters.edu.au. I'm happy to take emails um, most of the time, but if it's anything specifically to do with the actual content that we're covering, I'd much rather you put it on the forum so everyone can share it, so I can answer the question once and everyone gets a benefit from that. Uh, because you may ask questions that others are thinking about and uh, just haven't got around to uh, asking. So please try and contact me most times through the forums, uh, which I'll be regularly, uh, regularly looking at usually at least two to three times a day. Okay, overview of the course. We're going to have a bit of a quick look at the Cisco certification overview. So uh, for those of you who may not necessarily be completely across that, just to so you understand where the CCNA security fits into that. Uh, the exam requirements for the specific CCNA security exam. So that's the industry exam we're talking about there. As part of this course, this six weeks course, in week six you will be able to, you'll be eligible to sit a, a 50 question multiple choice exam which will give you credit for the CCNA security course that you're experiencing now. So that is completely separate from the actual CCNA security exam, the, certi the industry certification exam however, okay, so um, this is not, you, you won't get a CCNA security certification out of this but you'll get a uh, completion certificate from the MOOC and you'll get uh, knowledge which you can then use to go and sit your CCNA security exam at a later date should you wish to do that. And just for your reference, that's the exam number 
for the CCNA security exam 640554INS and we'll have a look at that in a minute on their website. Uh, I've had a, already had a couple of emails about online labs and um, tools that I think might be useful. I'll talk about those briefly and just some study tips to help you get the best out of the next five to six weeks. Okay, so certification overview. The CCNA security is a second level certification. And the reason it's a second level certification and not level one is that you must hold a valid CCNA RS. So that's a CCNA route switch. So that's your typical, uh, that's your vanilla flavored CCNA level certificate. You must hold a valid one of those before you are eligible to get the CCNA security certification. You can certainly go and sit the exam if you wanted to, but you wouldn't get the actual certification certificate from Cisco until you have a valid CCNA RS as well. The CCNA security exam also articulates with the professional level certification, so it builds on your knowledge as it goes. So you start with CCNA route switch, do your routing and switching qualification, and then jump into CCNA security where you will get your specific security components within an IOS router and switching environment and we'll talk about that as we, that's what we're going to talk about over the next five weeks. You can of course go straight to CCIE if you wanted to, uh, but you would need a lot of experience and that's not generally the way it's done. Usually most people will go through some sort of certification program. Even if you don't sit the exams, it's still worthwhile going through the certification uh, project. So if we just, I'll just uh, switch for a second to switch content and we'll just have a look at our, I'm just waiting for the screen to pop up so now you can see it. So what we're looking at here is the Cisco certification website. And what I wanted to show you, just briefly talk about here, is how the CCNA security articulates with the other certification tracks. So if you look down the left hand column, you can see Cisco now have a lot of different certification tracks and the one we're looking at primarily is this one here, security. Across the top here is the different levels of certification and the certifications in each column, the certifications that are relevant to, relevant to that particular level. So the CCNT is the absolute entry level certificate that as you can see you must need, you must pass that exam in order to go any further. Now the CCENT however is not a prerequisite, uh, even though it's on here, it's not a prerequisite for the CCNA routing and switching. Okay? It's, a, it's a certification that you can get on your own, but you don't need to get it. You can just go straight through to the CCNA routing and switching. However, with respect to all these other certifications, except there's one I think, I can't remember which one it is, I think it's service provider, you might not need it for. But for data center, the CCDA, CCNA security, service provider ops, CCNA video, voice and wireless, you must do the CCNA routing and switching exam, the official certification first, before you are able to go further in, in that certification stream. And we'll have a look at the CCNA security one specifically in just a minute. Uh, as I said before, they articulate straight into the professional center, the professional level certifications. Uh, and basically, it takes the, these uh, professional level certifications, just take the knowledge that you've used in CCNA and they build on it more specifically. So you'll do a particular subject on firewalls, one on IDS, one on you know, securing iOS devices, take one, on, one specifically on VPN, so it'll take you into much more detail. And then the CCIE is uh, the expert level, which is a complete level on its own. So um, unless you've had literally thousands, many thousands of hours experience, I would not recommend going straight to CCIE level. So if we just have a look at the CCNA security exam, so this is some of the concept that we're going to be looking at. Um, as you can see, prerequisites, any valid CCENT, CCNA routing switching or CCIE certification. Okay? Seems a bit, if you've got a CCIE certification, not sure that you want to go back and do a security CCNA, but you can if you want to. So as I said, you have those qualifications that you must do first. And then the required exam 640554INS, so implementing Cisco iOS network security. This is what we're going to be uh, talking about, some of the key technology areas in that as we go along over the next 
uh, six weeks. So I'll just flip back to my presentation. And we'll go to the next screen. Okay, so as I said, 640554 is the exam that you'll need to take for the certification. Um, this course, over the next five weeks, we will cover the core topics. But you will still need some further, you still, well, you may still need some more preparation, depending on your experience and your knowledge base already. Uh, so the outline for the actual exam itself, I've put up on the IT Masters web portal, so up on Moodle, so it's there under week one resources, uh, and you can see the topics that are, get, that are covered on the exam, and you'll see as we go through over the next five weeks, it will cover quite a lot of that off. And that, for your reference, is the URL where you can find that, that same outline. Just a note, and I think it's worthwhile, for those of you that aren't necessarily working um, specifically in the uh, in a Cisco environment, so you're not specifically working in a network engineer's position or security engineer's position, you can still get a CCO login, so that's um, Cisco Connection Online login, and you can just get that through cco.cisco.com. If you get, if you register for that login, it's free to register register for that login, you will get a lot of, you'll get a lot of information, you'll get access to a lot of design guides, technology guides, troubleshooting tech notes, all sorts of information that's absolutely invaluable. Um, I've worked with Cisco equipment for many years and I'm the first one to, you know, point out their weaknesses in many respects, but um, the, the CCO side is one of the things that they absolutely nail, they get it done really, really well. So. There's a lot of information, well worth getting a log into that. Uh, of course, if you have a Cisco support contract, you'll get access to a lot more information, but it's mainly to do with release notes for software and actually software revisions. You will still get access to all the technology information without having a service and support contract. So well worth looking into. Once again, cco.cisco.com, register yourself and, and get on board that because it's well worth it. Okay, lab practice. Now, we don't have any specific lab, uh, lab components of this course as a MOOC. Um, there will be times when I'll be doing some demonstrations on live equipment, but it's uh, you know, mostly hands off during the sessions. What I would recommend though is that you can use, um, there's a number of different packages you can use. I've had a couple of emails about them. One is uh, Packet Tracer, Cisco Packet Tracer, if you can get hold of that. Uh, it's not always easy to get the most up-to-date version because I think it's actually licensed now or they may only give it out to support contracts, can't quite remember. But if you can get hold of that, Packet Tracer is fantastic. Uh, it's fantastic for switches and routers. So that's as far as you can do that, okay? Um, but in terms of, if you, for, the, for a security component, I actually recommend using GNS3. Now GNS3 is a freeware, and I'll just flip back to my web browser, because I've got it up here. So GNS3 is a free emulator that will run on uh, Windows Linux or Mac OS devices, and basically it enables you to uh, build, up, build up a lab with as many routers, switches, and even now you can, it's also supported with firewalls and intrusion detection code as well, and even Juniper devices as well. So if you happen to be doing a junior course, uh, a Juniper course, you can also use it for that. So uh, as you can see here from their notes here, they will run Cisco ASA, PIX and IPS code, Juno S and most versions of Cisco IOS. Um, the routers, uh, for those of you that haven't seen it, um, the routers uh, that they support are basically 7200 series routers uh, and the switches are um, 2900 series and uh, switches are supported in GNS, yeah, I just sent a question come through, yes, CC, um, switches are supported in GNS3. The only caveat with this one is that you must have access to licensed software, okay, so you must be able to get uh, the license to a legal channel being able to be able to use it because you, you also need, uh, particularly for the ASA, the PICS and the IPS, you actually need a license 
to be able to pop onto your uh, emulator in order for them to to operate as you'd expect them to. So Gen S3 is a good one. Now the other thing is it's it's heavy on memory. Okay, really, really heavy on memory. Uh, so make sure you've got a, a PC or server or whatever with plenty of plenty of grub, uh, and then you'll be fine. Okay, very good, very good piece of software to use. Now in terms of Cisco Labs, Cisco don't currently have a security offering in their in their learning network. Okay, so there are there is um, a lot of route switch stuff there, little bit of CCNP level stuff, and a weeny little bit of voice, but not a lot of security. So um, if you had access to, uh, if you have a good relationship with your Cisco account rep, you might be able to get access to some equipment that will help you. Uh, but for the vast majority of you, uh, you're probably not going to have access to that. So I would think just whip back to your GNS3 or your packet tracer at a pinch. Okay, study tips just quickly, and then we'll boil into the content. So just some study tips that I always go through at the start of, and I'll whip through them all. Um, quickly, and I go through all these at the start of all the courses. So number one, test yourself instead of rereading your notes. So this is basic retrieval practice. So read your notes, put them aside, write down some questions, answer them. Okay, basically practice retrieving information, not absorbing information. Uh, in conjunction with that, test yourself repeatedly until it kills you. So keep going over and over and over and over again. Now talk out loud to yourself or a friend. It's great for me because I spend so much time talking in this role. Uh, so I get to hear all the mistakes that I make and all the silly things that I say and, and it helps to reinforce in my mind about uh, a lot of the technical concepts. Uh, distinctiveness. So this is basically your compare and contrast. So think about a, a couple of different topics and compare and contrast. How are they the same? How are they different? How can I apply them somewhere? Okay. And most importantly, apply to your own experience. And so as you're going through, as, we to, as I'm talking about things, think about how would I apply that in my workplace? Or where have I worked before where, hey, that would have been handy? Or I remember an experience that, yeah, that would have fixed or maybe that was the answer to it. Okay, try and apply it back to your own experience. It'll be a lot easier to absorb and a lot easier for you to remember. Beware of saying, yeah, yeah, yeah I know that. Yeah. Just because you're familiar with something or have seen it before doesn't mean you're really know it. Okay, and we've all done it. We've all said someone says, uh, would you like, you know, do, do you know about this? Do you know about BGP routing? People say, yeah, BGP, yep, yep, I'm right over it. Yeah, maybe not. You might be familiar with it, but you may not know it. So remember to practice, practice, practice. It's the only thing that will ever get into your head. And uh, read and study extensively. So once, you know, have a look at all the resources that I put up and then go and find some more of your own because there are literally thousands and thousands, well, millions out there on the internet. There's lots of lots of good resources. But just a note on that, make sure that you're going to credible places. Okay, so keep with your, um, in this case, because we're not talking about an academic subject, talk, think about you know going to the vendors. Go direct to a CCO link, a Cisco link, or direct to uh, a large, like someone like DiData or someone like that who may have information on the web as well. They're reputable links. You know, sometimes you might get the old study cheat sheets and all that. We're all well aware of all that pirated stuff that's out there. A lot of the time it's not actually accurate. It's full of a lot of bump and piffle. So make sure that you pick and choose what you're, uh, what you're going to look at. Okay, so the course topics. Here we go. Finally got to the real stuff. So we'll cover core topics of the CCNA security exam. So this week we're looking at hardening iOS devices. And we'll look about what that means in a sec. Next week we'll be looking at ACLs, access control lists. So all manners of ACLs, where you would apply them, when you would apply them, and the different types of ACLs that there are. Week three we'll look at firewall technologies. So not necessarily PICS or ASA, but how firewall technologies can be applied to an iOS device. Because that's what the CCNA security exam is more about. Once you get to CCNP level, then you will do an exam on a subject specifically on firewall technologies, on ASA or you know, well, ASA, uh, ASA now, and that'll probably be virtual. But at the moment, at this level, we only need to know how these firewall technologies are implemented in a Cisco IOS device. Uh, it's the same with the IPS, intrusion prevention system, and IDS, intrusion detection system technologies. We'll look at how they're um, 
how they're relevant for an iOS device. And then lastly, uh, the last core subject we'll look at is VPN and crypto. So we'll actually look at the components of crypto, what makes up crypto, what commands you need to use to actually configure it, and we'll actually do a point-to-point -point VPN, okay, which is actually a lot more straightforward than what it, uh, a lot of people make it out to be. Um, and then in the last week, week six, you'll be able to do a, as I said before, a 50 question multiple choice exam. Okay? It will give you a certificate for this course, for this MOOC course. It is not the official Cisco certified CCNA security certification. Okay? That, I, I've got to really emphasize that. Um, there's, sometimes there's a little bit of confusion about that. It, it is for the MOOC itself. Okay, so let's get into it. Week one topics. We're going to look at some network security 101. Uh, the basic guts of it, hardening Cisco iOS devices, so how to harden services, management access and best practices, all rolled into one. Now I've got to say there are some assumptions that uh, we need to make just at this point in time. One is that you already have a, well not necessarily have a valid CCNA certification, but a similar level of knowledge, okay? because we're not going to be doing any routing and switching. We're not going to be doing any basic uh, router or switch configuration. It's all specifically for security. Uh, and some of that will require you to have understanding of routing and basic router setup and basic switch setup. So you'll need to understand what spanning tree is. You'll need to understand that OSPF is a routing protocol and that it's a link state and how it works. And okay, although so we're not going to cover any of that. It's only going to be specifically for security. If if you're if you're after you know CCNA stuff, we also have a great MOOC that is still uh, available through um, IT Masters Moodle. So get on board that one if that's the particular focus that you're after. This one will specifically be on security, uh, the, sub, the, the topics we just talked about. Okay, security focus, not on general networking. Okay, so security 101, here we go. Why do we need network security? Okay, secure networks are moving targets. Everyone's always after, you know, there's a lot of people out there, a lot of people just casually mucking around on the internet, on networks, wherever they are, uh, they love to create mischief. But secure networks are moving targets. They're a lot harder to find, they're a lot harder to penetrate, they're a lot harder to, to damage. So security attacks and breaches are becoming more common and easier to perform. And this is because you know we're in the internet age now where everything is online. Uh, there's lots of lots of tools, free tools available um, to you know do whatever you want. So it, it's really it's easier now than ever, and that's you know that's at the top level of the internet, and that's the internet that 99% of people browse um, is you know not <laughs> the whole internet. There's a hell of a lot more that lies underneath it. If you think of the internet, it's like a dirty great big um, iceberg. You know, you've got a small amount above the surface and the vast majority of it underneath. And you know, even at that little small part that's on the surface of the internet, there's bucket loads of tools and well-known vulnerabilities that, that can be exploited as we go along. So it's very important that we make sure that as professionals we understand why we need security, how we implement security, and how to sell that to the people further up the chain from us. Because often it can be a hard sell. It's a bit of a black art security. Um, people don't necessarily understand it. It's it's similar to networking in that you know networkers and security people are seen as those guys that work with the flashing lights in the in the cabinets, but uh, you know it's not so generally well understood. It's not so generally well seen as what a server or a desktop, you know, those sort of guys that work with servers and desktops are. Okay, so sources of breaches. Okay, if we look at this slide, you can see there's there's plenty of uh, ways for something bad to happen to your network through there. So just as an example, you know, enterprise cloud network attacks. So if you've got stuff in the cloud, it can be attacked. Your firewall can be attacked. Your routers can be attacked. You've got viruses, worms, trojans, spam, spyware, phishing redirects, DNS poisoning, remote attacks. You've got attacks on your VPN. You've got denial of services. You've got distributed denial of services. Lots of stuff there. Okay, lots of stuff there. So as you can see, there's you hit from all angles everywhere. Okay, network attacks are always evolving. 
and this is the thing about security. I think my next point is, yeah, security is generally reactive to technology advances. Okay, so it doesn't matter how clever you are in the security space or how much money you spend in your technology every year. There will come a time when uh, there will come a time when the you know the bad guys will get in, or there'll be something out there that you won't be able to that will or something will happen and away away you'll go. Okay. So it's you've got to understand that if you're working in the security field, it is reactive. You can't always stop anything. So don't stop everything. Okay, you can go through lots of different secure designs, implement all sorts of technologies, but at the end of the day, there's always a possibility that something will go wrong. So attacks are becoming more costly for companies as the reliance on technology grows. So obviously in this age of the internet where everyone's online and everyone relies so much on their data and their uh, and their computerized systems that when things go wrong, it costs them a lot of money, it costs time and money. Because often we don't have those backup processes that we had many years ago. Okay, so you know something goes wrong with our link back to say if we work in a bank branch and our link back to head office goes down. Then in the old days we'd okay we'll just you know fill out passport by hand and away we go. They don't do that anymore. We just say sorry we can't do anything. And that's becoming more and more common commonplace across all industries. 60 to 80 percent of attacks come from the inside. Okay, Why? Because usually insiders have knowledge. Usually they have access and often we're unprotected. Okay, So there's not as much protection on the inside of most corporate networks as there is on the outside. Everyone worries about the internet and all these external, you know, external parties coming in when in fact we should be concentrating a lot more on the people that are actually inside our organisations. So sources of breaches. Okay, if we just look at this, is this is a little bit uh, a little bit dated now? But March of August uh, 2013, you can see the top 10 countries from where attacks originated. So the U.S., Russia, Germany. So as you can see, it's all over the place. Um, you know, there's interesting that China's not on there, but um, you know, there's lots. It can come from anywhere, and I guess the point I'm trying to make with this slide is that you don't know where it's coming from externally. You've got no hope in hell, but we do know what can happen on the inside. We know a lot of attacks come from the inside, so it, it sometimes it's you know it's great that we we try to get projects up and we spend lots of money on uh, technology on the outside and try to make our hard crusty shell around the outside of our network but we're all soft and gooey on the inside and that can sometimes be our biggest problem. Um, and of course one of the things is now with uh, chief executive officers or information technology officers or whatever you want to call them, uh, they, uh, it's often a really hard sell. It's already difficult. It's, it's often difficult to get funding for security projects because they're just sick of hearing it. They say, oh no, it's a buzzword. It's you know, something everyone's excited about but it's not necessarily accurate. Um, well it is. And it is something that needs to be considered. It's only, the, I, I suppose, the, the, the great thing about the internet is there are so many people that are on it and so many easy targets. And of course, as a hacker or an attacker, unless you've got a specific focus on a specific organisation, a vendetta against them, or you want to steal lots of money or something from them, you'll generally go and find the easiest target. Uh, so people like script kiddies or people just mucking around will generally try to go for the, um, generally try and go for the easiest target. So goals of security, three main goals of security that most uh, security uh, most security certifications will talk about. And it's called the CIA triad or triangle. So the first one, the C is for confidentiality. And then basically that's just talking about keeping your data private. Okay? Don't let anyone see it who shouldn't see it. Integrity is about keeping the data unchanged. So don't let your information be changed as it transits your network. And lastly, availability. So access data 100% of the time. Well, we know that's you know, really an unrealistic target. or well, maybe not. Um, that's always what we should aim for. Um, so we're basically just talking high availability as much as we possibly can. So risk and attacks, vulnerabilities, weaknesses that may be leveraged by attackers, and they exist everywhere. And we know that. There's plenty of vulnerabilities in in Windows desktops, in Linux, just, you know, everywhere, it's everywhere. It's in operating systems, uh, it's in networking devices, 
in firewalls, everything's got a weakness somewhere. Okay? At some stage or another, there will be a weakness found in just about anywhere. And this again is why security is often a reactive thing. Uh, risk is attached to the level of simplicity of exploit to a vulnerability. Okay, so um, if if a vulnerability is really simple to exploit, then it's more risky. Okay, if it's very difficult to exploit, then chances are it won't be. You know, people won't worry about it. You always same as water or electric. You always go the path of least resistance. Try to make it as easy as you can to get in get what the information you need and get out again from an attacker's point of view and that's what we want to stop them from doing. So who attacks? Well we know internal and external sources. There's white hats, grey hats, black hat, hackers. Okay, To me they're just all hackers. Um, I'm not really big on the whole white hat hacker thing, ethical hacking. Um, I think it's just a nice way to sell courses uh, but there's that's, a, that's, that's what we're talking about, white hat, grey hats, black hats, freakers in telecommunications. So I always think of Captain Crunch when I think about freakers. That's really old school now. Um, I won't talk about it, but you can Google it if you want, Captain Crunch. Uh, script kiddies, obviously. Hacktivists, people who have you know, ideals and morals about things. Um, academics. Hobbyists, people who just want to do it for fun. Plenty of those. I know a few myself. Uh, and obviously terrorists on the more serious side of the scale and of course criminals. So motives are well, political or idealism for your hacktivists, financial, criminals and scanners, scammers, espionage, spies, government or business, okay, so it could be industrial espionage or governmental, revenge, bullying, blackmail, okay, we've all heard them before. Types of attacks, you've got your scamming attacks, your unauthorized access, you've got theft, DOS, Distributed DOS, blackmail, many, many others, and I'm sure you could all, you guys could add substantially to this slide. I don't want to spend too much time on it because that's not what you're here for. So defence in depth is an important thing that we need to understand. It's one of the design principles that Cisco will test you on in their exam. Okay, so they may not have an overt question there that says describe what defence in depth is, but they'll expect you to understand what it is and be able to apply the principles of it, so the big picture of it to specific questions. Okay, So there may be a question written and it will give you four answers and each one of those answers may be slightly, you know, there might, there'll be three wrong answers and one right answer and that right answer, the difference may be your understanding of defence in depth and how that applies in a Cisco situation. So it's something that you need to understand. So it's basically a design philosophy that promotes a layered security architecture. So not having the hard shell on the outside only and we're all, we're all gooey on the inside. So defensive components against multiple types of attacks. Okay, so you build it up, build it up. Overlapping of defences, which goes back to that first point. The value of your asset determines, determines your security response. So if your asset isn't worth a lot, chances are it, it's in a more low risk category than something that's really you know, worth a lot. Okay, so that will determine what security responses you put in place to protect it. Uh, and strong encryption, AES, PKI, uh, if you don't use it. So this is a bit of an example. This is straight out of a Cisco text or a Cisco diagram showing, you know, one of the, in a sort of way that you could look at defense in depth. You've got your network IDS here, so that's connected to your switch. You've got your network intrusion prevention system. You can see that you've got traffic going from the internet flowing through your ASA straight through it. So it's in line. Okay, which means you can cut stuff off at the knees as soon as it starts happening. Um, you've got another uh, intrusion protection system off in this area in your DMZ, which is where you've got your web and your DNS server and external mail, and they've all got host intrusion protection systems installed on. So that's an example, uh, a pretty simple but you know fundamentally sound example of what the defence in depth would look like. Um, it's not a new concept. Okay, so this sort of stuff has been going around for years, years and years, as can, seen, can be seen by this graphic here. These guys have taken this building of this castle to, or village or city or whatever it is, to uh, the defense, they've applied defense in depth concepts to their structure. So how do we implement it? Okay, good question. In this course, the first discussion is with 
hardening iOS devices. So basic best practices, and we'll look at each of these individually as we go along. So password protection, enabling SSH, okay, they're two absolute sodas that you need to be able to do, so easy ones that you can pick off. Configuring login banners. Now login banners on their own of course aren't a security component in terms of they don't actually provide any security, but what they do provide is a warning. Okay, so legally in some jurisdictions you have to have a banner up that says you know, this is a protected system, authorised access only. I'm paraphrasing there obviously, there's a lot of other information you put in there, but uh, basically saying this is private, keep out. Limit access with ACLs, disable unused or legacy services. Now uh, iOS being a bit like a Linux type device has got a lot of legacy services that are still enabled in many cases and not really useful for anything. So turn those off. Uh, shutting down unused interfaces. Too often it's too easy just to go into a um, comms cabinet, plug a cable into an unused port and, port and bang, there you go, you're onto your network. Um, so unused interfaces should be shut down. Enable, uh, enabling of port security on switches. Disabling CDP, now that for me is a is a big one, is a difficult one because I, you know coming from an enterprise background, switching background, CDP is a brilliant tool to be able to use to you know where am I connected to, what am I connected to, what's it capable of, what iOS is it running, all that sort of stuff. Um, but in a security perspective you really should disable CDP. Configure network time protocol, so NTP is another big one and we'll look at that in this uh, lecture later on. Um, when we're talking about just making sure that your timestamps and everything actually, actually match up. It's useless having a log or a syslog somewhere if all the times and dates are you know, way back in 1993 or 1998, whenever your default clock is set to. Um, you really need to configure NTP to enable those timestamps to match up so events make sense to when things actually happen, when you notice things happen. And obviously configuring logging. Okay, all of those are basic best practices. So none of them are difficult to do, uh, you just need to actually go out there and do it. So, so the management plane, okay, on an iOS device a management plane is used to access, configure and manage the device, hence its name. So it sends and receives traffic for these functions here that we've got here, so SNMP, Telnet, SSH, FTP, TFTP, SCP, TACAX, right, you can read those there, so you can see that. So um, all of those there are management, uh, are valid management protocols that are really necessarily used. Uh, sorry, I've just noticed a question about CDP. Now someone's asked, uh, disable CDP when most networks are using this for VoIP. That is true, voice over IP does use CDP. What I'm talking about disabling CDP is not necessarily on your internal switches where it's used to deliver voice VLAN to phones, handsets. What I'm talking about there is on your uh, internet facing routers or DMZ facing routers or external partners or anywhere where you don't have the, the real requirement, the must have for CDP. CDP is a useful tool for troubleshooting and it's a useful tool in general but if you don't, you don't have to have it on then you know, turn it off because it, it, enables, it enables you to get a heck of a lot more um, information about a device that you're connecting to and LLDP is uh, pretty much in the same boat. Okay, so it's not really any more or less secure than CDP, it's just that it's a different, it's a slightly different technology. Uh, and of course if your management plane is exploited then control of your device can be completely lost and if you lost control of your device you know you can be in some serious issues. So first one, let's have a look at the basics. Passwords, uh, standard, you know, okay, it's just a required first level of protection, makes sense to have it. Minimum of secret password, so that means it's hashed, so inside your IOF, IOS you'll understand that uh, there is the ability to, to do enable password and enable secret, okay, so the difference between those two is that the enable password is not hashed inside your configuration unless you have another option turned on which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, whereas enable secret is MD5 hashed. So you can't immediately, it's not immediately obvious what the password is if someone happens to get hold of your configuration. 
uh, preference to use radius or tack outs, end or tack outs, or not end or, radius or tack outs. Um, but remember that your local password must be used for failover. So if you're configuring your radius and tack out services and something breaks, if you don't have a failover, a local failover or some sort of failover, then you're not going to be get it, able to, be get, to get into your device. As I said, enable secret. Service password is encryption was the service I was talking about before. If you enable that, that will actually hash all your passwords inside your configuration, whether they're uh, username, whether they're for individual users, uh, telnet passwords, console lines, whatever. Service password encryption will actually uh, hash all those up. And make sure that you apply your passwords to all inbound lines, so inbound logical lines, so your VTY lines, your Telnet or SSH. So not your physical ports, but your logical ports that come in. So code snippet, if we have a look, we've got username, name, secret, password. So that secret keyword will enable the hashing of the password that you place in there. You can also lock out accounts from iOS version 12.3 14T, okay, and that's a quite a little while way back now, but still in common use. You can do that with AAA new model. So AAA is AAA, so um, authentication, authorization, and accounting. So they're the three. So when I was talking about CIA earlier, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, they're three security tenants. AAA is a model or a technology used for authentication authorization so and accounting so that is who can come in proving that they are who they are with authentication authorization what are they actually allowed to do and accounting what are they doing okay uh, next code snippet triple a so triple a new model what that basically does is that enables triple uh, a on your router this one here, AAA, local authentication attempts, maximum fail, and then a number. So what that's saying is, if you're using local authentication and you fail more than this max attempt, then your account will be locked. Okay, and then your authentication method for login is by default, is default local accounts. Okay, so what this configuration is basically saying is we're going to use local accounts for authentication if we fail a certain amount of times, whatever that maximum attempt is, then you're out. You're locked. Okay, next keyword snippet. No service password recovery. Okay, now this is what this one does. I'm sure a lot of you may have done password recovery before. So that's when, you know, you've got a router, you've got no idea what, uh, what the password is, how do I get in? Okay, there's a, a process, which I'm not going to go through now because it's a little bit involved, but there's a process that you can go through, through powering on your router, hitting shift break, getting to a ROM mom, type, 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 type in some code words, and you're allowed to uh, boot the router without it paying any attention to its configuration. That then allows you to recover your password. If you use this keyword, no service, this key term, no service password recovery, that is disabled. Okay? Then it becomes absolutely vitally important that you keep a track of what your password is, because if you forget it, you basically bricked your device. There are ways to get around it, but it's a real hassle. Yep, so as it says, use with care as it does not permit anyone with console access to clear passwords in the configuration. So even if you've got console access, bad luck. And it prevents your config register changes. So the config register is by manipulating the contents of the common register, a lot of you will know, uh, you can uh, enable password recovery, it'll reboot, won't look at the config and away you go, you can get back into it. Uh, service password recovery, no service password recovery stops you from doing that. You've got to make sure you've got to back up the latest config, otherwise you're toast. Okay, disabling unused services. There are many useless services enabled which can be removed. Now, a lot of things which are uh, leftovers from old, old days, from many days past, that are no longer used. And they represent a classic target for enumeration techniques in particular. So it's not necessarily that there are vulnerabilities that can be exploited, but they will provide an attacker, a potential attacker with information about your device. 
Okay, so they may be able to identify what type of device it is, what code is running on it, and then from that, go and do just a search through Google or through CCO and find out how they can actually exploit vulnerabilities on that platform. So as an example, no service UDP small servers. Okay, so UDP small servers are the echo service, charge gen and discard. And normally we don't use those at all. Now that's different, that echo is different from an ICMP echo, which we do use. It's a UDP echo. And not very usual that you do um, not very usual that you actually would use that. So echo, charge gen and discard. Remember those. There's a reason why you should remember those. Uh, no service TCP small servers. Again, is very similar. It's TCP echo, TCP charge gen, and TCP discard, but it also includes daytime, the daytime service. Okay, so again, four services that you don't really need, you're not going to use. So get rid of them. All they provide is an opportunity for someone to find out more about your device than you really want them to know. IP finger, another one, get rid of it. Now IP boot P server. So these are these codes here, what we're looking at here is actually code that you can, if you wanted to, you can cut and paste this and put it into a live iOS device and uh, it would work. DHCP boot P ignore. So we're not going to listen to any boot P or DHCP requests. Okay. Um, we don't care. No service DHCP. Okay, so we don't want to run DHCP services on our router. No mop enabled. No, I won't even go there. That's an old legacy one. Uh, no OP domain lookup. Okay, so we don't want our router to be able to do any domain lookups. We want if someone wants to go, you know, you know, try to launch. If they happen to get what this basically does, if you happen to grab access to a Cisco router or a switch, and you want to, you don't know the IP address or something, but you want to launch an attack off that. If you use no IP domain lookup, then they can't use a DNS name. They have to know the IP address. So even though it's not necessarily a security uh, technique as such, what it does do is slow people down. No service pad, packet assembler, disassembler, but, you know, this sort of technology goes, you're talking about, you know, mid to late 90s type of technology. Uh, IP HTTP server, now plenty of people um, will use the web server on a Cisco router or a switch. Uh, personally, I think it's a bad idea. Um, there's, a, there's, there's, there's products that there's Cisco tools out there that rely on HTTP server. Um, I mean, it's HTTP, HTTPS, secure server, sorry. Uh, and that's, you know, that's fine in terms of at least encrypting the information. But again, it still provides an opportunity for someone to use a browser to connect to your router, brute force it, and then they've got access to it in a nice, simple point and click interface. Um, no IP HTTP secure server. Unless you've got, you know, I mean, if it's an externally facing device, there's no reason you would have this secure server running on it um, in most cases. CD, no CDP enable, we talked about earlier, no CDP run. So no CDP enable is on the interface, no CDP run is just in general configuration. Uh, no LLDP transmit, so we're talking about CDP before, LLDP is just a standard based version of CDP and again used in, in uh, heavily in VoIP networks, but again for this you don't need it. No LLDP received. Okay, so there's some basic snippets. Timeout sessions, okay, so for your console lines, again this is live Cisco code, line con zero, so this is talking about your console line, exec timeout, minutes and seconds. So put a timeout on your console line. So if someone comes up and they plug their um, plug their console cable in, then they will need to, um, you know, they can't, they can't stay on forever. There's a timeout, it'll die, okay? Just sent a question here about uh, small UDP servers, would it disable pings? No, it doesn't because we're talking about UDP pings, not ICMP pings, which are, are what you're talking about in terms of troubleshooting. So it's a different protocol, it sits in a different layer. Okay, back to the, okay, line VTY04, so this is your terminal lines. For those of you not quite familiar, VTY are your Telnet or SSH lines, just terminal lines. They can be Telnet, can be SSH, whatever. Uh, zero to four, so there's five of them, five available connections at any one time. Again, 
put a time end on those so that once someone connects, it doesn't the connection doesn't sit there forever. Plenty of times, you know, uh, people will log into a router and then go off to get a cup of coffee or something, and then they'll come back and it's still, you know, the the connection's still open. Someone can hijack that connection, they can take over the connection, or they can just simply walk up to your desk if you don't lock it, and away you go and start playing with your router. Sounds like overkill, but yeah. Uh, and just a note on the console port, Con0, that does not include, that is just the console line, that doesn't include the auxiliary port, okay? So you would also need to, uh, you could also potentially uh, set this up on the auxiliary port as well, but I'm going to talk about that just in a minute. Uh, so service TCP keep alive in, keep alive out. Well, misspelt that typo there. I've got cook it, yep, alive. Uh, ensure that remote end devices are still alive and that half open sessions are removed. Okay, so that's what these guys do. Okay, they ensure that things are still alive, so you haven't got any broken half connections. And that's important because if there are broken half connections, then they need to be removed. If you don't remove it and they keep building up, building up, building up, building up. There you go. Um, just see a question on DHCP and DNS. Uh, the DHCP and DNS are common day services, but remember we're talking about it from the perspective of a router and a switch. So um, the DHCP, yes, occasionally you do run DHCP from your routers, but you wouldn't be doing that to an internet facing router or a DMZ facing router or a router that you use in a secure environment. And remember that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about routers and switches in general networking terms. We're talking about them specifically with respect to secure installations. Okay, So we're really talking about the security components, not the general router and switch. So yes, sometimes you would run DHCP off your uh, servers, no, off your routers, sorry. But in general, those ones that are facing outbound, you don't do it to. As far as the DNS is concerned, all that all that DNS is is the ability for someone that's on the router to initiate a connection or a tro you know like a ping or a trace route or something using a DNS name. It's got uh, it, it does not prevent DNS from working through backwards and forwards through the router. Another question: CCP. Yes, you do need to enable uh, HTTP server on the router to use CCP. Uh, what I'm saying there with that as well is that if you're if you've got routers that are in a secure area or facing out into dangerous potentially dangerous zones, then my advice would be to turn that off and not use CCP and um, to use the, uh, the the CLI, so the the, um, the actual command line interface to configure rather than using the CCP. Okay, so loopbacks. The management plane should be accessible both in band and out of band. Okay, so you should be able to get to it using your physical cable across the network, and you should also be able to get to it using a loopback. So loopbacks are commonly used, particularly in routing technologies, um, where because loopbacks are a logical interface sitting inside the memory of the router, they never go down. You never have to bring them up. You never have to shut them down. They're just there, uh, and they're useful, particularly for uh, peering up in routing environments because they're always up. Okay, Interfaces can go down, therefore IPs attached to interfaces can go down. Uh, loopbacks cannot go down. Unless, of course, the physical interface through which you have to flow to get to that loopback is down as well. But then at least you know what the, the issue is. Use for inbound access. Yep. Okay, so the way you set up a loopback, interface loopback zero or whatever number you want to give it, Give it an IP address, no shutdown, that's it. Nice and easy. Okay, console access. You need to secure your console access using passwords or authentication servers. Often our routers or switches are in locked, well hopefully, most of the time they should be, in a locked cabinet secure location somewhere. Uh, and, and sometimes you just go, oh well we won't worry about a console password because no one ever gets into that back anyway. But it can happen. Um, Absolutely can happen. Uh, so you need to secure your console access as well. Reserve memory for it. Okay. So one of the big things with console access is if you if you have a major bust up with your router and you haven't reserved memory to be used for your console access, sometimes you know you've got no option but to power it down. Now if you've got to, to get access back to it, now if you've got a 2600, that's old speak now, 
or you know a, a little tiny router, then power it off and power it on. Yeah, it doesn't take very long. You know, you're up and going. If, however, you're using a Cisco, uh, you're using a 6500 or an 8500 series router, then you know they can literally take 25 to 30 minutes for them to power up. Okay, so in terms of because they've got to go through every single, depending on how many line cards you've got in it, um, how much memory, what sort of supervisor, do you have redundant supervisor modules, all that can take a hell of a long time to come up. Um, so you know. Reserving a little memory can be pretty helpful. Very useful in troubleshooting. Uh, I've got a question about the loopback addresses. Should they be private or public addresses? They can be either. It depends on the uh, use that you're using them for. If you're using them for, say, BG peering between uh, yourself and your provider, then you may use may use a public address. You still may use a private address as well, but you could use a public IP address. Internal to your network, you would normally only use private IP addresses. No need to have um, external IPs on your inside network. Okay, so why do you do that? Memory reserve console 4096. Okay, just see a question on uh, reasonable time to set on your consoles on VTY. Usually five minutes, so that would be exec hyphen timeout space five space zero, so it's minutes seconds. Um, so generally about five minutes is probably what I do it at. Any, anything less than that is uh, painful if you happen to you know, be on multiple tasks at one time, which of course as networking professionals we all are. Um, and anything longer than that though can be a little bit, maybe, you know, maybe 10 minutes at a pinch, but I wouldn't go any more than that. Okay, NTP, Network Time Protocol. Um, not a particularly dangerous service or, 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 you know, or insecure. Um, but any unneeded or insecure service can become some method for attack or for enumeration. But what it is really good at is extremely useful for keeping track of time when troubleshooting with your log. So as I said earlier, if, um, if you don't have any valid time source on your router or switch, then if things start happening, you go and look at the log, you can see you know, dates from 1993, 1998, depending on when your a piece of hardware was made and the iOS version on it can give you a range of different times which could be all completely useless to you. Even even down to, you know, even if you even if you set the time manually, that's great. But if you've got the time zone wrong or something happens, then you know your time stamps are all out of whack and then it becomes almost impossible to go back and match up what you know about's happened with the um, with the actual content of your log. So make sure, as I said, you can configure your time zone so that you know if you're in Victoria, Australia, then you configure it for Victoria, Australia time zone, and that you configure authentication to your NTP source if you can. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes you use an internet-based service and you can't authenticate that. Maybe in small installations, in an enterprise or service provider network, you might often have your own NTP server, or you might have an or you might have an arrangement with a provider, and you can provide that secure authentication, so you always know. Okay, ACLs, we'll cover these in detail next week. Okay, but for now you just need to make sure your devices are secured with ACLs where, where possible. Um, used for many different purposes, so restricting access, restricting information flow, identification of traffic, so not of people but of traffic, manipulation of traffic, and filtering. Okay. Just a question on UTC versus local time zones for logs. Um, depends on your organization. If you've got a global organization, you may use UTC, but generally, generally you would use your own local time zone. And that's simply because you know when you get reports in from different places, they will report it at the time that it happened, you know, not necessarily at UTC. But that's you know it's really up to you. MPP management plan protection. This allows your admin to restrict on which interfaces management traffic can be received by device. Okay, so it's a really simple protection tool. So control plane host is your keywords, your configuration, management interface, gig ethernet, 01, allow SSH and HTTPS. Okay, so it can only come in through the gig 01 port using SSH or HTTPS. Okay. Okay, just a question on the logs, on uh, how long do logs stay on switches and routers, dependent on two things. 
uh, how much memory you allocate to it. So you can actually you know, type in logging console or logging you know, wherever, logging buffered 4096, so you've given it 4K of memory in the buffer. Once that buffer fills up, it will just overwrite from the start again. Okay? But it depends on how often you get events coming through. If, uh, if you have a lot of events coming through and things are really going haywire, then that could be written over quite quickly. Uh, but in general, 4096 or 8019, uh, 8192, so the command would be logging buffered 8192 is sufficient. Okay, CPP, control plane protection, builds on control plane policing in order to restrict police control plane traffic or restrict or police control plane traffic that is destined for the route processor. So we're talking about larger enterprise systems here that you would use control plane policing and control plane protection. So you don't really need to know a whole lot about that, just that it exists and it's for policing the actual um, traffic that's going to your control plane. Okay, encrypt management sessions, so that means enabling your SSH. IP domain, domain, so in this case the domain is oldmate.com, IP domain name oldmate.com, you have to specify that before you can enable um, SSH. Crypto key generate RSA modulus 2048, so what that will do is that will generate an RSA key pair using the bit length 2048 bit length. Okay, so there are a range of bit length that you can use there, um, we'll look at that later on as we go further into the course. You'll see that when we start doing the crypto and the VPN later on. Uh, SSH timeout, so 60, 60 minutes. Uh, SSH authentication retries, you get three chances to jump in, otherwise, whoop, no. Nah. Uh, source interface, giganet, gigabit ethernet 0 slash 1, so that's where it's going to be coming from, okay? Now I just got a question, why not use VLANs to control access for the management access? You could do that, um, that's a, that's a, VLANs are a valid technology in use um, for the for security implementation. Uh, the reason we're not going to talk about that so much is because it's more uh, relevant for the CCNA uh, and it's not a particularly tested component of the CCNA security. So um, it is a valid, a valid question and a valid technology to use. I would always recommend that people use VLANing uh, not just for security but for traffic management and, and simply for breaking the network up into more manageable blocks um, but not specifically relevant for the topics we're going to cover so that, that's why I haven't mentioned it but nice question, thank you. Uh, so IP SSH version 1 or 2, preferably 2, IP HTTP secure server, okay so you would use that um, if you wanted to use CCP or you were using your web browser, as we said earlier though, normally we wouldn't use that. If you have to use it for whatever reason, make sure you use the secure version, not the, the um, plain text version. Uh, same with secure control pro uh, copy protocol, um, you know, use it. So that's basically copying using SSH as the underlying transmission technology. Use that um, and apply it to your VTY lines. Uh, so in that case you would use the command transport input SSH. So transport input says whatever this is the protocol that I'm going to allow into this telnet line, this VTY line. So in this case we're only going to use SSH. Console and auxiliary reports uh, gives you local physical access, we know that. Minimum of AAA passwords and exec timeout as we are talking about before with your console ports. Are common to disable the AUX port. Okay? Not a lot of time you need it all the time. Sometimes you might plug a modem into it to, um, to be able to remote access to it. Uh, in general, uh, nowadays you just disable it and you do it this way. AUX0, transport input none, so we're not going to allow anything in to the AUX port. Transport output none, so we're not going to let anything out of the AUX port. No exec, so we don't run an exec command, so you can't get in by the AUX port and hit the enter key and get a command prompt, nothing will happen. Um, and exec timeout, just to be safe, no minutes, one second. So every second times out cuts you off at the moment. No password, can't log in. Okay, VTY lines, secure similarly to your console, minimum of AAA password exec timeout, ACLs protect access to and from, so it stop you from, it might stop you from going from your router outbound to somewhere, it'll also stop access coming into your router. Okay, banners. 
Um, in some jurisdictions, it's impossible to prosecute without warning banners being displayed. Okay, so you need to have some form of banner. It's good practice to have some form of banner which basically says, you know, this is a secure system. Don't enter unless you're authorised or without specific authorization. You have to be really careful with the wording and what you put up. You don't want to be, you know, putting all over it, you know, uh, blah 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 bank, or right? because as soon as you do that, people, you know, might go, oh, I wonder what this is. Let, go to log onto it. There's the advantage up. Oh, hang on. There's a okay. It's a bank. Oh, I'm interested now. Um, also, never put things like welcome or any sort of wording in there that would make fee people feel that it's okay. Oh, no, it's okay to come into your network. Okay. Uh, just a question on examples of banners that are legally enforceable. Uh, I haven't got any in the notes, but I can put some up on the uh, on the resources page on Moodle for you. Uh, so legal requirements are complex and they do vary between jurisdictions. Okay, so what I might say or what I might put up, you know, in Moodle is a caveat on that that it may not necessarily be applicable to whatever area you're in. So you need to check your local laws, local jurisdictions before you put anything up. Um, be careful with it. So seek advice when configuring one. Because I mean if you're in a if you're in a in a low risk environment where your information is not necessarily that um, uh, that uh, valuable to anyone in particular, then you may not have to worry about it. You know, it might not be a big deal. But sometimes it does. You know, sometimes it is really, really worthwhile. Sometimes it really does matter for some installations. So think about it. Okay, AAA. Critical to sue this. Oh, another typo. Oh, terrible. Critical to use this framework to provide authentication, authorization, and accounting. Okay, and we looked at it a little bit earlier. So we're basically talking about TAC or radius. So enabling your uh, enabling your router or switch or whatever device you're on to use TAC or radius. So we enable that by AAA new model. There's your authentication. So AAA authentication. So in this case, the first day of the AAA authentication. Login processing default. Your group. You're going to use TACAX plus and enable. Okay. So that enable on the end is important. TACAX server host. So that puts in your actual TACAX server. This is a TACAX server that you're going to use. And that's a TACAX server key. Okay, I'm just having a giggle here. Someone said that I owe everyone a beer for every typo, so that's two two typos, two beers. Whew, with the number of people on tonight, it's going to be a big evening. Okay, so getting back to lecture, TACAX server key, and there's a hacked up TACAX password. Okay, so if you're going to use these TACAX passwords, then yeah, you know, make sure that they're at least uh, half reasonable and not just password. Um, you can also uh, encrypt your TACACs as well, um, and we'll see an example of that later on in the course uh, once we get to that. And once we get to the encryption part, we'll see an example of that. Um, you can definitely use that. STNMP, use later versions 2C or 3 because they are more secure. Uh, make sure you have complex strings. So SNMP server community read only. So that's your string name, read only. Uh, no, don't do that. You can do something like that, maybe. SNMP server community R3 at D0NLY, read only. That's better. Um, you could also, yeah, I mean, you don't even have to have anything that's even indicative of a name. You can just put in a string of characters. As long as you document it somewhere and you know what it is, it's no big deal. But obviously, the harder it is to guess, to randomly come up with, the better it is, particularly with SNMP because there's so much you can do with it. Um, in terms of changing configuration, getting information off the route, you know, there's lots of stuff you can do with it, so it needs to be secure. And also use ACLs to secure that. So who you're sending traps to and who's sending new requests. Logging, um, again an obvious one, not necessarily because it stops anything from happening, but it'll at least give you a way to backtrack and do your investigations. Uh, so logging host 192.168.1.23, that's who we're going to log to. You can also log, this is quite nifty, you can also log to your non-volatile storage as well. And this is the way you would do that with the command line. So logging buffered, that sends it to your buffer. Logging persistent URL disk zero, syslog, so syslog, so that's basically your, your um, flash card. 
in the directory slash syslog. We're going to give it a size of this amount and the file size is 16384. So 16384, so basically 16K of information that you're going to land it right out. Now it doesn't sound like a lot, but it actually can be a lot. Uh, or you can copy disk zero syslog to FTP, okay, to your FTP survival. So you can ship it off. You can log ship it. Uh, just a question on logging and syslog. Are they the same? Um, in essence, yes. Okay, so they're just logging. Logging is the process of taking information from your router and putting it somewhere. Okay, whether it's in the buffer, whether it's to a disk, whether it's off to a server, um, or wherever. Whereas syslog is the actual protocol or the software process that that receives the, that information from your router devices. So think of being a syslog as a daemon, whereas logging is just the process of transferring information from one place to another. Um, another question, you can log to another server. Uh, so I've got a question, can we log to another server and would this be a security issue? Um, it is often preferable to log to another server. Nine times out of ten you want it to log to another server because you want it recorded somewhere. If your device is compromised and that information is raised and you've lost all access to it, but if you're logging off to a separate server, then that's great. Normally those servers would be in a secure area. So in a DMZ or in a private party network that only these iOS devices have access to send syslog back to. So you'd have to now, so again, it's all part of your defense in depth holistic security um, design. But typically you would ship it off to another server, yes. Okay, control plane hardening. We've got some IP, IP ICMP redirects. ICMP unreachables, proxy ARP, okay, and ACLs to restrict your received traffic. So I don't want to talk about too much about those. They're not specific. They're not covered in any huge detail on the exam. But it's just worthwhile to be um, aware of control plane hardening processes, and and particularly those particularly in particular uh, proxy ARP. So that is um, not allowing your iOS devices to respond to ARP requests of devices that are off their network and control plane policing. Okay, data plane hardening, again, we don't want to spend too much time on this. It's just to flick through the options that you've got. Again, not covered in any huge detail on the exam. So data plane hardening includes looking at things like IP options, disabling your IP source routing, disabling your ICMP redirects, so don't send any information and say, oh, you can't go this way, go that way. Uh, IP-directed broadcasts, well, we, we don't like broadcasts anyway generally in networks, so we try to keep them down to a minimum. Traffic filtering with ACLs, okay, so again, so we're talking about a data plane here, okay, so this is where your actual traffic comes through your router. And anti-spoofing, okay, unicast reverse path forwarding. So if a packet comes in and says, I'm from 10.10.30.1 and it's come out from the internet, you'd sort of look at it and go, well, your private IP address, you sure as heck shouldn't be coming from the internet, so you drop it, you wouldn't respond to it. It's obviously bogus. Uh, IP source guard. Um, port security. Now, port security is a bit of a bee in my bonnet in a lot of ways um, because port security is can be, depending on the device and what iOS versions you're on, uh, is, is a bit notorious for uh, falling in a big heap. Um, it can, it can sometimes create more problems than what it's worth, but it is a best practice as far as uh, Cisco is concerned. One of the main areas you'll find complications with it is when you're running voice over IP. Uh, not, not so much Cisco handsets, but if you're running other vendors over the top of your Cisco switches and you enable port security and you're not careful with how many sticky VACs and MACs that you allow inside the port, you can have some issues. So. You need to just be careful with that. It's, it is a good technology, particularly if you've just got hosts plugged in or you've got, uh, say, ports out in a foyer or an anteroom where people just come and plug in for shared internet access, then port security can be a useful thing to use. Um, but I'm just saying be wary of it, be careful of it. Okay. So in summary, and I'm just before I go through the summary, actually what I want to do is just whip off and show you a, um, 
and a secure router template which I uh, had a look at today, found today, which I thought was quite useful. So this is from uh, this particular website, so I'm not going to take credit for it, um, but it, it contains a lot of the stuff that we're actually talking about tonight. So I'll post this up to uh, our Moodle as well, so you'll have access to this as well. It's just an example of a lot of the things we're talking about that we're, I've been talking about tonight. Um, with reference to a specific topology, which they talk about here a little bit, how they've got the topology set out. Um, but there's a lot of things, so the, the parts in bold are what we're talking about. Okay, Service Nagel, that, that's a little bit old. Um, by default, it's not enabled on Cisco devices anymore, so you might not have to worry about that. But again, see service TCP keep lives in, TCP keep lives out. You've got your service timestamps, okay, so your um, making sure that your debugs and your logs have got timestamps on them. Service password encryption, you're turning off your DHCP service. Host name, well, that's not really a security component, but it makes sense to have a host name for your own, uh, own use. Um, one that I haven't talked about tonight, which is actually useful too, is boot system flash. So what that's basically doing is that's saying boot off this particular iOS. Okay? So if someone comes along, pulls out the flash card, pops in another one, and then, you know, at a later time, your device reboots. If the configure, if that, that particular file is on that flash card, then your device just won't boot. You'll know something's gone wrong. Um, and sometimes that's done because sometimes people will do that to, you know, introduce a vulnerability. There's been cases where that's been done to introduce a vulnerability. And so by doing this, you sort of you partly mitigates against that. Again, logging buffered. Okay, 16k debugging. No logging to the console. So we don't want spurious messages spewing out on the console. And again, I won't go through it all because you know there's there's a lot of this stuff we've already covered tonight, but it'll give you some more in-depth examples of it and actually inside a configuration so you've got some idea how it's actually applied. And over the next few weeks we'll actually be I'll be doing demonstrations where you'll we'll be typing stuff in. I'll be typing things in and you'll get a really good idea of how it actually hangs together. So that's an example of of one, one example of a possible secure template that you could use. And there are plenty of others available on the internet. Um, you can see here they go through a bit of rate, li rate limiting on the Ethernet interfaces. Um, that could be useful, Depend again, depending on your situation. As most of us know, with, with engineering questions and security um, implementations, the answer is always it depends. Okay? Is this technology worthwhile doing? Are these commands worthwhile putting on my router? Yeah, well, it depends. Depends on what your end requirements are, what your goals are. Okay, so I won't go through that any more now. I'll pop that up onto Moodle so you can have a look. Um, if you've got any questions about it, feel free to pop them up on the uh, forums, and I shall answer them uh, as soon as I possibly can. Okay, so in summary, there's many tools, many things you can do to harden your iOS devices. Okay, bucket loads of them, and we've only we've covered. Some of them, we've covered the core ones tonight that you need to understand for the CCNA level security exam, but you know, they're not all of them by all means. Um, and as I said before, you pick and choose which ones you need based on your security requirements. So again, it's a, it depends. It's always it depends. But it's useful to be at least familiar with most of these for the CCNA security exam. So readings on Moodle. I'll put up the Cisco Harding Guide. I'll put up that template we just had a look at. Um, there'll be a PDF version of the slides. It will be available in two formats. So it'll be one slide per page, three per page, with some areas for notes. Um, I'll put up the ones for next week's lecture as well um, uh, within the next couple of days. So you'll get those and you'll be able to have a pre-read of those before you come into the MOOC next week. So next week we're going to be talking about ACLs in depth. Okay, so uh, named, reflective, standard, extended, uh, mainly to do with IP. So we're not going to be talking about IPX and Apple talk those. I mean, all those ACLs are still existent and they're still there, but um, we're not going to actually look at those in depth. Otherwise, same time, same place. So 7 p.m., uh, that's where we're going to be. And thank you for attending. If, as I said, if you've got any questions, log in to uh, Moodle. So the IT Masters online learning site, and uh, pop any questions you have up on uh, the forums there, and I'll answer them 
as good as I can. All right, so good night for now, and uh, we'll catch you all next week. Thanks very much.